for us to imagine or fathom what that really means, but you know, according to your word that you are from everlasting to everlasting, there has never been time without you, even before time. You always were. And you always will be. We thank you, Lord, that we are a part of that. You have included us in your eternity, Lord. We look to you, bless you, thank you. You are most high. You are our Lord. There's none like you. God of one. I invite you to stand with us if you like.
precious Lord, reveal your heart to me. You are holy, holy. You are holy, holy. In your presence, fullness of joy. Lord, you are my portion. In your presence is mercy and love. Lord, you are my God. I will bless you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord. I will worship you, Lord God most high. I will bless you, Lord. I will praise you lord i will worship you oh lord god most high oh lord you are my portion you are my god in your presence is fullness of joy Lord, you are my portion. In your presence is mercy, love. Lord, you are my God. I will bless you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord. I will worship you, Lord God most high. I will bless you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord. I will worship you, Lord God most high. I will bless you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord. I will worship you, Lord God most high. I will bless you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord. I will worship you, Lord God most high, oh Lord, you are my portion, oh Lord, you are my portion, oh Lord, you are my portion, you are my God. I will bless you, Lord, I will. Praise you, Lord. I will worship you, Lord God most high. I will bless you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord. I will worship you, Lord God most high. I will bless you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord. I will worship you, Lord God most high. Bless you, Lord, I will praise you, Lord, I will worship you, Lord God most high, oh Lord, you are my portion, oh Lord, you are my portion, oh Lord, you are my portion, you are my God. In your presence is fullness of joy, Lord, you are my portion. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without 
comes my way and when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Thank you for our time of worship and praise and adoration, Lord God. There's nothing like singing to the God that we love. There's nothing like intimacy between you and us, Lord God. We want to thank you tonight that you meet us, Lord, exactly where we are, Lord God. And we also know, Lord, you have a plan for each one of us tonight, Lord God. So work in us, Lord God, that plan. And Father, touch your, our hearts by your spirit tonight, Lord God. Now we open ourselves to you. Have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. God bless you. Be seated this morning. Tonight, I mean tonight. <laughs> We're glad to hear tonight. If you have your Bibles, turn to the 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. Mm. 
Last week we saw Samuel address all of God's people at the second coronation of King Saul after they had defeated the Ammonites in Jabesh Gilead. God had given them the victory. Samuel had also told them that if he had taken anyone's ox or donkey or if he had cheated anyone or took bribes or looked the other way or oppressed anyone, tell them now. And they all said, no, you didn't do that. And we shared with you about the importance of integrity, how Samuel lived a life of godliness and what it meant to be godly and to live with integrity. Samuel then tells them how God had delivered them in the sense of their fathers from Egypt. And when they had forgotten the Lord, he allowed them to go back into slavery to other nations. Then when they cried out to the Lord, the Lord would deliver them. And he used men such as Jephthah, Gideon, Samson, and, and Samuel. And then Samuel tells them how they wanted a king. And God didn't want them to have a king, but God gave them what, he, what they wanted. And God warned them what would happen. They would take his children, their children, not all of them, but some of them would be servants for the king. They'd take their crops and take their land and give it away and they would lose it but they still wanted a king no matter what and so God did give them a king and Samuel ended the chapter last week at the warning but if you do wickedly you shall be swept away both you and your king so we want to continue in verse 1 of chapter 13 Saul's the king and he reigned for one year and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 2,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in the mountains of Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of, Gib of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. <clears throat> so we're starting to see, for the first time in Israel's history, an army. Remember last week, Saul had called all of the people and because they were going to go to Jabesh Gilead, they were going to defeat the Ammonites because they were going to destroy these people, put out their right eye, and they would become slaves. So Saul gra calls all the people. He sends out oxen, pieces of oxen, and says, if you don't come, this is what's going to happen to your oxen. So many people came. 330,000 people showed up. Well, they're all there and the, it, the war is more over. They have defeated the Ammonites. And now Saul is going to pick an army or choose an army. Choose the best men. He will choose 3,000 men out of 330,000 men. And he will start his army. 2,000 will be under his control and 1,000 will be under his son Jonathan's control. This is the first place we see in the scripture where Jonathan is mentioned. He's the eldest son of Saul. And he'll be a man of God, as we will see. He'll be one of the best friends for David. And he'll be a man that is brave and courageous. He will just be a great man. Now, it says here that Saul chose for himself 3,000 men. You know, I, I, my mind is always moving when it comes to decisions that are made by men such as Saul or men such as David. Or, and my thought is always, okay, how did he choose these men? And my thought is always, I hope that they prayed and asked God which men were chosen. And it's possible that he did pray and ask God and God guided and leaded him. But I also believe that he, in the time of when he fought the war against the Ammonites, that he saw by example many men who were brave and courageous, men who were not afraid and went into battle in the heat of the fight and were men that totally took on the Ammonites 
and we're fearless. He also, I believe, got men that, from his leaders that suggested take these men. And I have no doubt that he picked the cream of the crop. But again, I hope that he prayed and asked God who he should pick. Should we pray and ask God of who should be in a position such as this? Who should be the soldiers? Who should be in a place of authority? Because they will be in authority. I believe that God desires for us to pray for people who he puts in authority, but pray for those who God himself decides to be in those positions. When I was in a, I won't a different a denomination, I, we're not in a denom denomination now, but when I was in a denomination, they would choose a pastor, they would choose a Sunday school uh, superintendent, they would choose men in positions of elders, or they would choose them. And what they would do is they would get the congregation together, like on a Sunday morning, and they'd present somebody or five pe different people, and they would say, okay, we want you to vote on who you think or whether you think these people should be in. And you vote for number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five. And you may have never met any of them. You may know one. You don't know who's qualified and who's not qualified. And they may call you this morning and say, we're going to make a decision concerning even a pastor. We're going to get rid of the pastor because we don't like what he has to say anymore. And that's how it worked. And so after church on Sunday morning, you could all vote the pastor out. As long as you had 51%, you could remove the pastor. Isn't that kind of crazy, don't you think? And I've seen that happen. And I'm not talking about one time. It was a local church that did it every six months. They had a new pastor. They fired him. So how do you, how does God choose a man? How does God put a pers person in a position that he has called him to? And how do we know that that's what, what we're, that God puts him in that position? First of all, we need to really pray that God is the one who chooses and we need to allow God to choose that person. I'll tell you right now, I did a lot of voting when I went to that church. I was only there for a couple of years, three or four years, but I did voting and man, I was dumb as a rock. I'm, I'm serious, I was dumb as a rock. People would say, you need to vote for this person. They'd tell me and then I'd say, okay, well, I'm for it. Uh, when we were, my wife and I were young, we, I, we got saved at, tw at 27 years old and I had never been to Christian church ever in my life and in a matter of months, I was in charge of the whole Sunday school because I was young. They voted for me, everyone voted for me. I go, I don't even, I'm barely a Christian. All I'm saying is, we need to make sure that God is the one who puts him in and God chooses. Now, he goes on in verse 3, And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Gibeah, and the Philistines heard it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all of the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all of Israel heard, and it said, Saul had attacked a garrison of the Philistines. And that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. And the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. So we see this man, the son of Saul, named Jonathan, attacked a garrison in the, Phil in the Philistines. Now, the Philistines are, first of all, the most powerful army in the area. They have chariots, as we're going to see. Israel has no chariots. They don't even hardly have a, a sword to fight with. We'll see in a moment that Jonathan and Saul are the only ones that really have any kind of weapon. The other ones are going to be using hoes and, and they're going to be using all kinds of weird tools to fight. But Jonathan, he believes that God has sent him to fight this battle at this time to attack this garrison. And he goes and he literally wins and beats part. Not a, a garrison is not a huge army yet. That's just a small section of it. But he goes and defeats this garrison 
And literally, it takes an act of faith by Jonathan to step out and do this because he himself is not able and neither is his men because they are not equipped. There are going to be times in your life that God's going to have you step out in an act of faith. Now, there are times that God says, you're prepared and to go do this. Each time I get up and I teach the Word of God, I am prepared. I'm ready. I don't come up here and think, well, let's see, I'll just fling it. That's not how it works. But there are other times that God says that I'll meet somebody that I haven't seen or somebody that I've never known before to share the gospel. God says, you just need to share. You need to say this. This is what I want you to say. Today, it was yesterday, I'm sorry, I was talking to a neighbor across the street. And I've been praying for them for a period of time. And so I said to him last night, I said, you know, can we meet together? I need to sit down and talk with you about something. He goes, sure, I can't do it tonight, but I can do it. How about Thursday? And I said, that's fine. Let's sit down and let's talk. You know, and I know God's going to prepare me on what to say exactly what that man needs to hear. His family's not saved. He's got four or five uh, grandkids there and none of them are saved. But the thing is, is this. I know that God wants me to talk to him. I've been praying for him. The same thing, an act of faith, you have to step out in an act of faith and God will honor that. And God will provide everything you need. God will provide everything you need. It says here that Israel had become an abomination to the Philistines. When Israel was weak and stayed where they needed to be, as slaves because literally the Philistines were in control of their lives completely. They were literally slaves to them. And as long as Israel never tried to do anything to get free, the Philistines said, you know what, you guys are great guys. But as soon as they began to want to get their freedom from the Philistines, literally they became abomination to them. Now, let me say this. Freedom doesn't just happen. I'm going to say it again. Freedom doesn't just happen. If you think that because I'm a Christian, I'm just going to be free as can be and do nothing concerning the fight that you, are, you and I are in. The Bible says we fight not against flesh and blood. But what do we fight against? principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. Whether you like this or not, if you're a Christian tonight, you are in a spiritual battle. And you're either climbing and winning and staying free or you're not and you're going right back into bondage and slavery. And let me tell you, as we apply the Word of God, as we live the Word of God by the Spirit of God, literally what happens is, is we get free. The Bible says that God has come to set the captives free, and it's true. But we have to do our part concerning what God has called us in freedom. You are not going to win a battle by not fighting. It isn't going to happen. I don't care who you are. It's not going to happen. In order to be free, we have to enter the battle. And there are so many Christians today who have forgotten that there is a battle to maintain their freedom. Now, I want you to notice something that's really important. All of Israel heard that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines. We read that in Scripture. But the Bible teaches here, in this verse right before it, that Jonathan attacked the Philistines in the garrison. It wasn't Saul. But Saul didn't say anything about it, anything to anyone about that it wasn't him. What's my point? My point is, is this. Saul took the credit and didn't correct it. That it wasn't me that won the victory, but it was my son. You see, why I'm pointing that out is you can start to begin to see what kind of heart Saul has. In a moment, we're going to see a, a man named David, and we're not going to go into any real depth in it. 
But we're going to see that David had a heart after a heart after God. And his heart was one that was concerned about God, not about himself. Saul was a man whose heart was after Saul and Saul only. And what God can do for Saul, not what Saul was to do for God. So we see him taking the credit instead of giving it to his son. Verse 5. Then the Philistine gathered together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in the multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of beth Aven. So the Philistines are gathered together against this rebellion of Israel. And we don't know how many thousands of people. We know they have at least 30,000 chariots. And usually a chariot has two people in it. So that's 60,000. We know for sure they have 6,000 horsemen, so that's 66,000. And they have shoulders as the sands of the sea, so we know, you know, who knows how many. But there's a lot. And remember that Israel right now only has 3,000. They are really outnumbered. So what should they do? When they are outnumbered, what should they do? Let's look at the next verses. When the Israel saw that they were in danger, when well, the people were distressed, and the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. So it says here that the people were distressed, and they were, when they saw they were in danger, they literally began to hide. Instead of the nation gathering together, like he did against the Ammonites, this the opposite happened. The people scattered, and Saul would go for having an army of 3,000 to an army of 600, because they would scatter too. The ones that Saul had, taught, had picked 3,000 of them, he ends up with only 600, because they hide too. When fear grips the heart, it causes them to run and hide in every place possible. It's amazing what fear will do to us. It will capture us and control our thoughts and our lives. Fear can make us cowards, while trusting in God and looking to Him make us brave. I must be, believe that God is in control and God will supply all I need for every battle to win. As long as we are surrendered to his will, God will fight for us. In the book of Proverbs chapter 3, it says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And it says here, And all the people who followed him trembled, so Paul had a following. Imagine this. He has 600 men. That's all he has now out of 3,000. The opposition is in the hundreds of thousands, probably at least. And the ones that are following him are scared to death. They're trembling. They're fearful. Probably he's thinking they're going to run too. So this is where Saul is at. In verse 8. Then he waited seven days, according to a time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened. As soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. So Samuel speaks to Saul, and he said, listen, I want you to go over to Gilgal, and you wait there for seven days, and I'll be there. When I get there, I'll do the sacrifice. Don't worry. What he's really saying is everything's going to be okay. It'll be all right. Just do as I say. It says here, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Samuel didn't come yet in the seven days that he 
has told him he's going to come. He's going to come, but he still hasn't come yet. Imagine this. You have five or six hundred men. The army of the Philistines are just all over the mountains. And the first day goes by. And so what are you thinking? I Probably if I was Saul, I wouldn't be sleeping at night. So he's probably at this point 24-7. No sleep. Being anxious. The second night comes. You're probably thinking, I can't wait for the seventh day to come. The third day comes, the fourth day comes, the fifth, and now comes the sixth. One more day, and then comes the seventh. This is it. This is it. Samuel's coming. Without a doubt, Samuel's coming. But he's also a leader in the sense of he knows that he has to do something quickly because if he doesn't, he's going to be destroyed, he believes. It's hard to wait at sometimes, isn't it? It's hard to sit there and wait and not do anything. So he decides he's going to do something. He decides he's going to go and he's going to do the burnt offering. Because, see, the burnt offering represented literally that God was with them. They had to do this sacrifice and God would be with them. So he says, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to do this. Bring the sacrifice. But the problem is that only the priest was to do the sacrifice of the burnt offering. Nobody could do that, not the king. In fact, there is another story that the Bible teaches about a man named Uzziah. How many remember who he is? Uzziah was a king uh, during, uh, of Judah. And the Bible teaches he was a king for almost 60 years. And the Bible teaches he was a great man of God and God prospered him. And he really, really followed God until he was about being king for about 50 years. And then the Bible says he got lifted up in pride and he went into the place of the holies and he wanted to do a sacrifice also. He wanted to do what the priest did. And the Bible says he got leprosy and they removed him out of the holy place and literally he dies of leprosy. My point is, when God calls somebody to do something, only that person is supposed to do it. And th when he, Saul goes out of that calling as king and puts himself as priest, he's in trouble. Big time. Now, verse 11 says, And Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, When I saw the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that Philistines gathered together at Michmash. And I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal. And I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. The first thing that Samuel says, and Samuel knows already what he's done. He asks the question, what have you done? So why does he ask him that question if he knows already? I believe that he's trying to give him a chance to confess and repeat, repent, I mean. Because I believe that he's trying to say, look, you need to ask in the sense of forgiveness from God and then you need to repent. But Saul doesn't do that at all. I have, as I've studied the Bible, I continually see, even in the book of Revelation, where God is always trying and given the opportunity for people to confess and to repent. Even those who don't know God, even those during the God's judgment, he's constantly trying to bring them to repentance. And I believe that God is doing this through Samuel towards Saul. I also want you to notice as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel came. All he had to do is wait like an hour more and his whole life would have been changed toward the good if he would have just waited. There are going to be times to wait and there are going to be times to move, beloved. 
But there is never a time to go against the word of God, no matter how compelled we are. He says, you did not come within the appointed days. He did come in the appointed day. But he was just an hour late, later than what Saul wanted him to be. And what he's really saying to Samuel is that this is all your fault. If you've come earlier, this wouldn't happen. I wouldn't have done this, Samuel. It's your fault. We need to be careful that we don't try to blame our sin on somebody else. It's that wife you gave me. Adam started from the very beginning. Beloved, the first rule of having authority of others is to be under authority ourselves. You know, my wife and I, we've married a long time, and I just use this for an example. She doesn't have a problem with my authority over her. I'm not her boss. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm her husband. I love her. But she doesn't have a, a problem with me saying, we need to do this, honey. We pray about it and all those things, and we agree on it. But she knows I'm under a great authority. I'm under the authority of Jesus Christ as my Lord. And I'm not going to do anything on purpose that's going to go against Christ, first of all. I pray about, God, what do you want? What's your will concerning this? And, and it's true. We as men are under the authority, are to be under the authority of Christ. And when we're under the authority of Christ, there's not a problem with being in authority concerning others. As leaders, we need to be careful that we do certain things. We need to pray for those who we lead. If not, it is a sin to us. It is a sin for me as a pastor not to pray for you people and especially our leadership. It is a sin for me, without a doubt. And I know that. As leaders, we do not need or act to act presumptuously. Obedience will establish your authority, and First Samuel speaks of that. Leaders need to honor all ministry equally. Those who support others are equally important. Beloved, when Saul was charged with disobedience, he justified himself in what he had done. And he gave no sign at all of any repentance for it. It is not sinning that ruins men, but sinning and not repenting. Falling and not getting up again. Notice what he says here. This kind of was a mind blower to me when I read this. I felt compelled. In other words, Saul says, I was forced to do this because of circumstances. Even though it was against the word of God. Now look at me. Whenever we go against the word of God, no matter what the circumstances are, we're wrong. No excuses. And we as people can come to a place of where we justify to go against the word of God with our children, with our grandchildren, with our husbands, with our wife, whatever it may be, because whether we might feel like it, we just, I just felt like this because I need to do this, even though I know it's against the word of God, God understands. No, he doesn't. One of the worst things you can do is allow your feelings to control you and make decisions that are contrary to the word of God. David says in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a line to my path. I need that. I need that. Not my feelings. If I was to go along with what I was compelled, how many of you ever felt like doing something that was completely wrong, but you didn't do it, thank God? Because you might end up in jail, or you might end up in prison, or you, you might end up whatever, losing. He 
he goes on in verse 13 and Samuel said to Saul you have done foolishly Samuel Saul I mean you have not kept the commandments of the Lord your God which he commanded you for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever but now your kingdom shall not continue the Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart and the Lord has commanded him to be a commander over his people because you have not kept the word you have not kept what the Lord commanded you then Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin and Saul numbered the people present with him about 600 men so Samuel tells him you have done foolish Saul I want to read that word to you in the Hebrew a person with little or no judgment no common sense or wisdom and they kind of use it and I don't think this is really an important part but they call him a simpleton now I know a lot of young people that fit this bill and when I was young I fit this bill also but after I grew up and I got older and I began to know the Word of God and began to learn the Word of God, allow the Spirit of God to work in my heart concerning the Word of God and change my heart, literally, I began to understand and began to get wise concerning how to apply the Word of God and live the, live the Word of God. As an older Christian, I shouldn't be a foolish man. I don't care who you are, whether you're a woman or man, you should not be foolish. There is a stronger phrase and we might think concerning this word. Samuel is not saying that Saul is unintelligent or silly, really. The Bible speaks of the fool as someone morally and spiritually lacking. We've all done things that are not wise. But four things we need to remember concerning that thought. One, was my, right, my heart in the right place when I did it? Two, did I learn what not to do? And three, did I realize I sinned against God by not obeying his word? And not men. And four, did I truly repent? Listen to what he says. For now the Lord would establish your kingdom over Israel forever. The whole point of being a king is for your son to reign after you to establish more or less a monarchy in Israel but because of this choice that he made literally God will reject him that's a heavy thought isn't it but that's what will happen to him David will replace him but he's rejected by God Saul was a disappointment. He possessed many excellent natural qualities for leadership. He came from a good family. He was humble. He was tall and good looking. But he couldn't handle power. Beloved, there are people like that, sweet and gentle until placed in authority. You know of anybody? The position seems to go to their heads and they become tyrants. I'm in control. I'm the boss. You got to do what I say. I'm in charge. Put a badge on some men and you create a monster. Why was Saul rejected? He did not keep the commandments of God. Listen to this, beloved. No man can rightly rule who is not ruled. The centurion said to Jesus, I am a man under authority having under me men. If a man at the top of a chain command of command does not recognize his responsibility to the authority of God, corruption, tyranny, slavery ensues. That's how it works. Saul failed as a ruler because he failed to submit to God. And no matter whether it be a king, no matter whether it be a pastor, no matter whether it be a man, a husband, a family, 
the same thing will happen if that man, that person in authority, does not submit to the authority of God. That's how it works. We have to submit to the authority of God and the Word of God. A man who has submitted to the authority of God in his own life. God sought for a man among them that would be submitted to him that in reality God would still be ruling. I want to say that again. God sought for a man among them that would be so submitted to him that in reality God would still be ruling. You see, what God wants to do, he wants to rule through you in your family, in your position at work, or whatever it may be. God wants to rule through you. And so he's still the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we can say that. Because I've heard people say, Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. But they don't say this when I let him be. The Lord of your life means that he wants to be the authority of your life all the time in your life in every situation in every circumstance that's what God wants and you may say well wait a minute he wants a little bit too much control whenever you're in control you're in trouble when God's in control everything will go exactly the way it needs to go this is where Saul so completely failed Now I want you to notice that God was not seeking a perfect man because there is no perfect man. Ask your wife. God is looking for a man whose heart is turned toward him and there's the key. David was a man that truly sought God and wanted God to be glorified. It wasn't about David. It was about God. That's the difference. Saul's heart was a heart was it about how is God going to benefit me? How is God going to give me victory? How is God going to make me king and keep me king? How is God going to... It was all about him. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't want to bless your life concerning what your needs are. That's not what I'm saying. That's not my point in any way. Here's what Jesus said. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. In other words, if God is first, you don't have to worry about those things. They'll be taken care of. But Saul was one who didn't seek God that way. A man after God's heart loves other people. Saul became increasingly bitter against people and lived more and more into himself. David was a man after God's own heart in the way that he loved people. When David was down and out, he still loved. And he served those who were even more down and out than himself. Beloved, a man after God's heart enthrones God as king. For Saul, Saul was king. For David, the Lord God was king. Both David and Saul would have thought, sacrifice, important before the battle. But David thought it was important because it pleased and honored God. Saul thought it was important because it might help him win. For Saul, God would help him achieve his goal. For David, God himself was his goal. Big difference, isn't it? So Jonathan, verse 16. His son, Saul, Jonathan, his son, and the people presented them, remained in Gibeah of, of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. Then raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned to the road to Ephrath, to the land of Sheol. 
Another company turned to the road of Beth Haran, and another company turned to the road of the border that overlooked the valley of Zobom to, toward the wilderness. So they're trying to bring them out to fight. The Philistines are. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshed, his mattock, his axe, and his sickle. And the charge for a sharpening was a prim for the plowshares, the mattocks, and the fork, and the axes to set the point of the goads. So we really see that the Philistines are very smart and how they're smart is they let them have no blacksmith so they can't make any weapons to come against them. Now, it says here that the Philistines would go down, the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshed. So they're guarding their technology that keeps the Israel lights in subservience are be slaves continually. I thought about this in the sense of us as Christians, how the devil wants to keep us slaves and in sin and in the power of sin when God has really broken that power of sin over our lives a long time ago. I thought about how the devil lies and how we can believe his lies and how they can keep us in bondage or he can keep us in bondage concerning lies. Probably one of the greatest things that the devil does is he's the greatest liar that there ever was. And probably one of the worst things we can do is believe his lies and allow them to affect us. Some of the lies he tells us is that, you know what? You'll never be free. There'll never be a change. You could never change. God could never use you. This is always going to be the same, just like it is. In fact, it even is going to get worse. But those are all lies from the devil. God says, greater is he that is innocent, he that is in the world. The Bible says we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. God wants you to be free. But the devil wants you to stay in bondage. I don't know what bondage you are in today, but God doesn't want you into that, no matter what it is. God can free you, but it comes by believing his word and then acting on the word of God. Now, verse 22 and 23, and we are done. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of those people who were with Saul and Jonathan but they were found with Saul and Jonathan his son and the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmath so if you look at this story in its ending you see that Israel God's people whom God loves are in a difficult place you may look at the story and you say, it's over for them. Hundreds of thousands of people coming against them. They have chariots. And the, God's people don't have anything but axes and uh, melocks. And they don't have anything. Two people have, have swords. They're in trouble. They can't win. It's impossible. Next week, you're going to see that God does give them the victory. They do win. And the chances of that is pretty slim. But God is greater than the multitude. One man with God is greater than a million without God. That's how it works. And God is always for his people. There are times that God allows things to happen because they go against the word of God. But God is always for them. God's love never stops. It continues to flow. And no matter how dark it looks out there, God is still in control. God is still in control and he still sits on the throne. Okay, we're going to stop there tonight. Any questions on our study tonight? 
We'll get a lot more deeper into the heart, David, a heart after God as we go through the chapters down the road. I wanted to skim by it tonight. Okay, tonight we have the Lord's Supper. Will our worship team come up, please?